Well, I want to welcome you all to this session. Thanks for making time in your busy Expo weekend. We're here to actually take responsibility for the power and the impact that our industry has, our food and farming industry, also the power that we have as shoppers and buyers and purchasers because we're voting with our dollars. So I want to acknowledge that we're here to take that responsibility and also take a bold leap forward and hold a high aspiration for the potential of our industry to do good. We're here together collectively to tackle the impacts of climate change and loss of topsoil and the impacts of our food and farming system on people, on our health, but also our livelihood and our well-being and the well-being of animals in our food and farming system. And we're going to talk about how to tackle that using a strategy called regenerative organic certification and the standard that's behind it. And I want to introduce you to five of the brave leaders who stepped up, who hold this powerful vision for the potential of our industry to transform and have a positive impact in all those areas, climate, soil, the well-being of animals and people. David Bronner, who's the Cosmic Engagement Officer of Dr. Bronner's. They're an iconic and fearlessly progressive personal care brand, and I would venture to say that they've probably cleansed and moisturized many of the people in this room today. <laughs> <laughs> and generations of progressives around the world. I know since I was a child, I learned a lot from reading the labels on their packaging. So thank you, David. <coughs> I also want to acknowledge Rose Mercario, who's the president and CEO of Patagonia. They're an outdoor company, but I would say they're also an activist company. And they've been leading the charge on responsible sourcing and product development and using that to fuel their environmental activism and stewardship. So thank you, Rose. Jeff Moyer, who's the executive director of the Rodale Institute. And they've been a progressive beacon in the organic movement for most of this century, providing education, farming research, and advocacy for organics. They were also the emissary of organics here in the United States, so they brought over the concept many, many decades ago. Thank you, Jeff. And I'd like to introduce Leah Garces, who's the executive director of Compassion in World Farming, an advocacy organization, and they fight for an end to factory farming and all of the negative impacts that we've heard about coming through that system, and for the rights of animals and the welfare of animals in our food and farming system. Thank you, Leah. And finally, I'll introduce Dana, who's the co-founder and executive director of Fair World Project. And they're also an NGO and an advocacy organization working on behalf of small-scale farmers and family farms around the world and for fair labor principles and fair trade principles. So thank you, Dana. With that, let me just delve right in. We're here to talk about the regenerative organic certification, the why, the what, and then the how, meaning how can you get involved and participate. <laughs> Uh, so I want to kick that off by asking Jeff from the Rodale Institute why this coalition, the Regenerative Organic Alliance, which is represented by the five of you here on the stage, was formed, and what is the impact that you hope to achieve? Thanks, Nova, and thanks everybody for, for being in the room today. We're really pleased to see such a turnout. I think before we begin to talk specifically about regenerative organic, we have to understand that there's real power and meaning in words. There's power in the word organic and there's power in the word regenerative. And going back in history a little bit, uh, way back to into the 30s and 40s when J.I. Rodale was working on a system of food production that he called organic agriculture and really brought that to the forefront of, of the country. It was really important to him to formulate a link between soil and human health. And I think if he would have been uh, around today, he would have included planetary health as well. And the industry grew slowly through the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s as progressive people and innovative people caught on to his ideas and read what he was writing. But he passed away in 1971, and his son Robert Rodale took over. And Robert was a real person of the, of the world. He traveled a lot. And at that time, the country, the U.S., was beginning to latch on to the word sustainable and sustainability as it pertained to many different uh, facets of business, including agriculture and food production. And as Robert toured the world, he would say, boy, you know, I meet a lot of people that aren't really interested in sustaining what they've got because they have a really poor system. And he was looking for a word, again, believing that there was power in words. Uh, around that same time, 
he was busy trying to give away the word organic uh, because he said to me, he said, if organic is growing too slow and the world needs its help too much to try to hold it tightly within the, the, the Rodale sphere or within some small certification organizations. And so him, along with many others, worked to try to give that word to somebody, and of course the USDA now holds that word. But in the process of doing of that, of giving something away, yes, you have the chance to make it grow, but you also give up some control. Just like when your kids leave home, you want them to leave home, you want them to grow, but you lose some control there. Maybe a lot of control. <laughs> At least with my daughter. Um, and one of the, so we lost some pieces that were really, uh, he felt were embodied in organic, and he was looking for this word that would bring that back home, and he started to use the word regenerative as it pertains to agriculture. People in this country didn't like it, they turned away from it, people internationally gravitated towards it. But now the industry has pretty much played out the word sustainable and sustainability to the point where it doesn't mean too much or it means everything, depending on who you talk to. And so now the industry is slowly gravitating towards the word regenerative. <coughs> uh, at Rodale Institute, th those are our words, we believe passionately in them, and we really believe that in order to be regenerative, you must be organic. And in order to be organic, you really should be regenerative. The words are somewhat separate, but they can't really be separated in the way we're looking at things. So in our effort to create the regenerative organic standard, we want to build on the decades and generations of work that's been done to create the word organic. Uh, you, if you read our standard, you'll see that it stands on the backbone, or the backbone that builds that standard is organic. We love that word. Uh, we're never going to turn aside from that word. But we recognize that there are some gaps in that word in terms of what we think should be embodied in the production strategy, as well as what customers and consumers believe maybe already is in, embodied uh, in their values within the, the context of, of organic. And some of them are, those gaps are by design and some are by default. Uh, we lost the concept of continuous improvement when the US state DA took over. So our standard uh, is not as dynamic maybe as some of us would like it to be. Maybe it's more dynamic than some of us would like it to be as well. Uh, so the, the regenerative organic standard looks to build on organic and then fill in some of those gaps. The organic standard is completely quiet on the issue of social fairness and farm worker standards, and so we want to fill that in. It's not quiet completely on animal welfare, but it doesn't go far enough for some of us. And then the idea of soil health, while it's uh, the verbiage and the text is in the law and in the regulation, uh, those of us who are certified organic and have inspections on our farms, we all know that the amount of attention paid to soil health isn't always what we'd like it to be or what we think it should be. So we're trying to build on that and create this new standard. We've gotten a lot of feedback over the last four or five months as we continue to refine and build that standard. So it's an open and transparent system. Uh, we've worked very hard over the last year or two with all of our partners. And I think we're at the point now where we're ready to launch what we've done and, and see what we, can, what we can do with this high bar standard. We really want to be a catalyst for change. Not everybody can meet this new standard, and we recognize that. That's not necessarily bad. If everybody meets the standard, then what's the point? You know, it's not really incentivizing change. We want to be a catalyst for change and move people in a very positive direction, and we see this high bar standard, building on organic, moving the needle, and, and driving industry uh, to a point where consumers can really uh, find the values they want in the products we produce. And I want to invite David to speak a little bit about regenerative organic makes so much sense for Dr. Bronner's. I'll start with the story of like, how did we really become conscious of the impact that our supply chain and agricultural footprint has. And it was maybe 20, 18 years ago when Guayaquil came in strong into the market and really raised the issue of, you know, the Guayaquil uh, is a yerba mate brand, sourcing yerba mate sustainably harvested in the rainforest uh, by the Guayaquil tribe and preserving the culture of the Guayaquil and the rainforest from destruction in a, in a really beautiful, sustainable model. We had committed to going organic kind of around this time frame, but, you know, even going organic, we were buying, like most people do, um, you know, buying on spec from brokers, on price and spec 
and not knowing really where our raw materials were coming from ultimately. What were the farming communities? What were the practices? Was there fair prices? Were the farm workers being respected or exploited? You know, we had no idea. We committed to transitioning our supply chains to, to identify farm working communities or, or farmer communities for our relevant raw materials, which is uh, coconut oil, palm oil, olive oil, and you know, establish direct trading relationships and certify them not only organic and, and help with best regenerative organic practices, but also ensure fairness and fair trade principles were being followed. Inspiration kind of grew out of that example that Guayaquil had and <coughs> other brands, but they're separate certifications. And you know, as Jeff alluded, one of our Regenerative Organic Alliance members is Michael Sly from Agricultural Justice Project. And Michael Sly was the first chair of the National Organic Standards Board. And social fairness and social criteria were always part of the organic movement, but when or the organic principles became codified as regulations, we lost, um, we lost the piece that addresses social fairness. So that there's not, you know, it's migrant labor moving from a conventional lettuce field to an organic lettuce field. There's no difference as far as, you know, any, any kind of criteria as far as how they're being treated, what's their wages, what's their working conditions. I mean, it's great that they're not getting blasted with pesticides. Obviously, that's huge. But nonetheless, you know, we have a real problem within the farm labor sector. You know, it's almost like an apartheid labor system we have in this country in, in many respects. So, you know, like really bringing in the social fairness piece is really important um, to a, a truly sustainable, holistic uh, agriculture. And then really importantly, animal welfare, even though I'm personally vegan now 22 years, I've been on a deep dive visiting really high level farms, mixed livestock, cropping farms, and really appreciate that pasture based livestock can contribute to a much, a very healthy farm ecosystem. And, when we farm in nature's image, like a wild ecosystem has a, a sustainable balance of animal life and plant life and, you know, drastically, re, you know, reducing our, this, the level of meat we're eating, getting the, the, the animals out of their cages, integrated back into our farm, into our farms and, and, and managing them correctly and, you know, with rotational grazing and, and other criteria that are, that are embedded in the regenerative organic system can actually be beneficial for the land and, 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 and for people. Um, and instead of being such a huge disaster on the planet right now, which factory farming is, uh, before I came here, I was, uh, I was attending a peyote ceremony with the Huichil tribe in Mexico and had been holding 8,000 years of unbroken peyote ceremony. Uh, they've never been conquered by the Spaniards and we were visiting as part of a delegation because they're facing pressure from ag interests and mining interests and we're strategizing how to preserve long-term access to sacred peyote lands and and we got to participate in an all-night uh, peyote ceremony, which was r really beautiful, and it was a world unification prayer. And as, as, as the sun came up, they sacrificed a young bull. And this was, you know, very intense, but, you know, part, you know, symbolizing life and death and rebirth. And, um, you know, on the one hand, it was a very intense, difficult experience, but on the other, this was a bull that had lived a life worth living. And this is exactly, you know, and, 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 and I'm in solidarity with farmers who, who are farming ruminants and, and their farm animals in a way that respects their lives and, you know, and that the day of their slaughter is, is, is quick and clean. And this is what we're, we're embedding in the regenerative organic standard. You know, I felt like that sacrifice of the bull in some ways, like it was setting up like the, this, you know, coming here with the regenerative organic pilot certification launch, it was almost like, um, you know, kind of like a covenant between humanity and animals that needs to be restored. That respect needs to be restored. Um, and I really think that the regenerative organic standard, you know, really embeds that necessary, um, you know, the, just the, we, we need to restore the balance of life and death and, and respect on the planet. Um, and it was interesting because I ran into Leah then immediately as I was thinking all about this at the Advantage car rental in LAX, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and Leah heads up Compassion World Farming and, you know, she's just a, a huge advocate and the chair of the Global Animal Partnership. So that's just a crucial, huge piece of the regenerative organic standard as well. And now I want to invite Rose to tell us how the Regenerative Organic Alliance and this certification standard align with their business philosophy and give us some insight into the links to your new business Patagonia provisions. First of all, I just want to say I'm really sorry I missed the peyote ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was working that day. <laughs> <laughs> I was working. 
hard, <laughs> <I> internal, <laughs> hard internal work. <laughs> shift in their supply chain and converted 100% of um, our cotton and our product line to organic cotton. Um, it was a very difficult task. Uh, there was only chemically grown cotton at the time. I don't use the word conventional anymore. I'm just going to say chemical, chemical cotton. And that was a big shift. You know, we had to do everything. We had to build a supply chain. We had to set up NGOs. We had to uh, finance farms. We had to do everything to sort of do the right thing. You know, our founder, who's an amazing outdoor sportsman and climber, Yvonne Schrenard, um, you know, he was used to living a life outdoors. And once he saw how cotton was being grown, he saw immediately the impacts to biodiversity, um, to the health of the workers who were spraying chemicals, to um, the effects on topsoil, which was eroding and turning into dead zones, basically. So he wanted to make this big shift, and um, you know he had to convince the company, which was hard to do, because everybody was scared that we wouldn't be able to sell the product, <laughs> we, that we wouldn't be able to get the supply chain going. But he went 100%, and he went all the way. And since then, we've been responsible for a lot of major shifts in supply chains and building certifications. We're, co-founder of the Fair Labor Association. We've done a lot of groundbreaking work around social and um, animal welfare initiatives. And, um, and then in 2012, we started a food company, Patagonia Provisions, and that's led by Birgit Cameron over there, who's amazing. She um, started working on building products, not just organic, but also you know products that could um, innovate um, the way we're doing agriculture and um, restore and regenerate the planet instead of destroy it, basically. And we found out that, you know, the organic standard, while we appreciate it as a baseline, and I think it's so important that it's there, because if it wasn't there, we'd have nothing. It would be total chaos. And the chemical companies would basically be in control of all of it. You know, there are pieces that, you know, we feel are really missing, and, and I think that's, um, that's why we decided to sort of develop ROC as like a, an innovation platform and a place where the science could come and the people who really kind of like care about these issues could come together and think about them and where we could influence policy and, and I think that that's a really important part of, of this whole process is this continuous improvement and learning from each other and creating a world where we're actually improving on these practices that we're learning instead of just ceding all of our power and ceding all of our like energy to chemical companies to take it over. I sympathize with the OTA. It's hard for trade organizations to go in there and try and fight all these battles as a trade organization. You know, brands have to stand up and they have to stand for something because our politicians are just being bought and sold by chemical lobbyists. It's exactly what's happening with the NRA right now, right? We saw it in public lands. You know, there were three million comments saying we care about public lands and we want to protect them. But then the politicians did just the opposite because of oil lobbyists, right? So the lobbyists are running Washington. So the brands have to be strong and they have to step up and they have to communicate to their customers and they have to be fearless. And so I think we have to have a high bar. We have to constantly be focusing on a high bar on continuous improvement, because if we're not, and we all want to learn, like the people who care about their supply chains, we all want to learn how to do it better. And we're used to taking impossible things, like Leah said to me earlier today, and making them possible, right? We can do it. So that's why we're here. <laughs> and I want to point out how these brands that are here on the stage with us have really been leading this transformation in business practice looking at materials and sourcing and designing products with that in mind versus looking at a product and a market for a product and finding the cheapest ingredients that meet their quality spec. That's a real transformation and that's necessary to create the market demand for these regenerative products and support these regenerative farms um, and processing facilities around the world. We're now gonna delve into the what of this regenerative organic certification program and we're gonna focus on the three pillars that form the basis of it, 
and also point out some of the unique elements of the regenerative organic practices that all of you will need to consider when you think about getting on this journey with us. And to delve into those pillars, I want to invite Jeff from the Rodale Institute to start and tell us about the soil pillar. Well, I think what's really important to, to keep in mind as you look at all three of the pillars is that our, our goal in general was not to recreate the wheel. There is a lot of really great work that's been done, of course, in the organic standard, we all know about that one, but also in the areas of animal welfare and social justice. So we did not try to rebuild that and create language from scratch. We were very inclusive and inviting and in bringing in other voices that have, have well-vetted language that we, that we used. Then one area where we did take some liberty in creating new language was around this concept of soil health. 20 years ago, the Rodale Institute had a workshop where we invited leading soil scientists from around the world to talk about soil health. Because if you think back, G.I. Rodale, when he first started organic, he wrote those words, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people, on a blackboard. He said the only way we can be healthy as people is if we take care of the soil. What we do to the soil, we do to ourselves. That was what he said all the time, and I believe he was right. And so when we looked at the soil health piece uh, in that context of that conversation with soil scientists, it was supposed to be a two-day conference. We spent the first day and a half arguing about using the word health in connection with soil. Because they only wanted to talk about soil quality. Soil quality is something that we as farmers have a difficult time impacting because you get what you get. You either bought it, rent it, stole it, however you got it, you have access to it, but it, it is, uh, there's nothing I can do with my soil in Pennsylvania to make it the same quality as my friends in Iowa. But I can make my soil very healthy and very productive, as can they. And I would say that in many cases, my soil in Pennsylvania is far healthier than many of the farms across the Midwest that have higher quality soil. So much of the things that we're talking about in organic and talking about in this standard are things that farmers should be doing anyway, but aren't always. There's, there's a problem with that. Many of us see a problem with that. And we want to make sure that all organic farmers are in a position where they're viewing their soil, the basis of their entire operation, from the context of continuous improvement. Again, you know, it's, it's not part of the organic standard, but it's part of the regenerative organic standard. Because we want to continuously improve that soil. It's not good enough to get in the club and stay the same forever. There's no industry can survive standing still are not being dynamic in the way they view their most critical resource. Many of our counterparts have criticized us in the organic industry for years, saying we till the soil too much. You do too much tillage. Therefore, you talk about soil health and you pay lip service to it. But the reality is, if you're an earthworm, tillage day is a pretty bad day. Uh, and you do it over and over and over, saying you're trying to improve earthworm populations, but then you use tillage. We struggled with this. How do we? Uh, incorporate this pillar of soil health into the design of our standard and still give farmers the latitude and the leeway that they need to pursue their agricultural activities in across all the regions, not only of this country, but of the world, because this is you know, intended to be at some point a global standard. And we responded to many of the comments that we got from farmers across the country and around the world that said, we have issues with this piece or that piece within the original standard we put out. And we think we've done a very good job of, of listening, incorporating those comments into our, our document to make it practical but still meaningful. And so, yes, we are trying to incentivize or be a catalyst for change with this document. It is a high bar standard. It's not easy for everybody. There are farmers maybe in this room that say, I can't make that standard, and that's OK, because we still have organic, and we're not throwing that under the bus. We're, we're supporting it at every, every point along the, the value chain that we can. But there's components that you see listed on the, on the screen there that relate to soil health, and many of those we all should be or already are doing. We're just trying to formalize the strategy of capturing that information within the standard, within the inspection, within the certification, and document how we're working continuously as farmers and land managers and land stewards to improve the health of our soil. And now I'd like to invite Leah to tell us about the animal welfare pillar. Thanks, everyone. I don't know if I can come after all these people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think the next board meeting should be a pair. Yeah. <laughs> why would Compassionate World Farming, why would an animal welfare organization want to be part 
of a regenerative organic standard. And I think fundamentally we're an organization that is against factory farming. And we're against it for, for, first and foremost because of farmed animals and because they're sentient beings and we're trying to reduce suffering on the planet. In the last 10 years have come to realize that factory farming is also an existential crisis. And it's one of the things that is threatening the future of our planet and the future of our food supply uh, more than anything else in the world. And when we looked around at what could we point to, most of what was out there was falling short. And the main reason was because it wasn't considering outside of the farm, where the animal was being maybe raised on farm, but wasn't considering where the feed was coming from. What regenerative tries to do in terms of animal welfare? We think that by putting animals back in the land, connecting them to the land, that's where you see the best animal welfare happening. And this standard really speaks to that. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of how we framed it conceptually in terms of the animal welfare. Um, there are three standards that regenerative organic um, is, is pointing to as a starting point uh, in terms of animal welfare. And they are global animal partnership, they're cert uh, certified humane um, and animal welfare approved. And those three standards have been around for a while and farmers are using them and they know their way around um, in terms of those certifications. And we're taking the highest part of those certifications, so the ones that are only referring to pasture raised uh, on, on outside all the time kind of practices. So in GAP, Global Animal Partnership, that means just the highest, so it's a one through five system. So we're talking about only four and five um, and with Certified Humane, that's only where it's referring to the pasture-raised side of it. And with um, Animal Welfare Approved, that's already only pasture-raised. So that would be a starting point for, for this certification. So how does it differ? How does it go beyond that? Crucially, there, there are two parts, I would think, when I think of it, that are crucial to how this differs. One is rotational grazing. We're requiring animals to rotationally graze, which means you're not having one animal on one piece of land uh, and their droppings are, are, are kind of flooding that ecosystem. Instead, you're thinking carefully about that animal's contribution, how that animal can actually regenerate and bring landscapes back to life. When we talk about sustainability, which somebody already said has been kind of hijacked and is meaningless now, which is true, we don't want a sustainable standard because sustain means as is keep going, like just as we are, and we all know as we are is not okay. And regenerative is about healing. It's about a corrective action. And this standard is about a corrective action. And the role that animals play in destroying the soils is very, very significant. I will tell you a story where I, uh, a couple years ago, um, went to the Gulf of Mexico, and I got on a boat um, out of, in Louisiana and took the boat 15 miles into the dead zone because I wanted to see what it looked like. It was pretty frightening. You get out there and um, you, we went in the water, we jumped in the water. I, to my, not, not a good idea, not to be done at home, not recommended, <laughs> jumping into a dead zone water. But um, the dead zone is a place where there is, um, towards the bottom, it is, there is no life left uh, in that water because all the oxygen is gone. And when you look around, you think, what's going on here? We're 15 miles out from the coast. What could be happening here? Um, and there's strange things happening, too, where the fish are higher up in the water, and there's jellyfish, which are you know, kind of primordial species that can exist in low oxygen. That's all you're seeing there. And so we started to look at what's going on. And what's happening is, all the way up the Mississippi, all the way, way hundreds of miles north, are corn and maize being grown in huge monoculture, huge GMO fields, far as the eye can see. And who is that being grown for? Primarily factory farmed animals. And we went to visit those farms too. So we looked in Idaho and Nebraska and looked at the farms that were there. And those farms um, are growing this corn. This corn is then being shipped out all over the world. It's going down the Mississippi in boats, and it's going, it's going west to then go out boats towards Asia, and it's going all over the world. Our country is growing maize all over the world for factory farmed animals. That, when it rains, all of that pollution comes down the Mississippi, and it goes into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's destroying the Gulf of Mexico and creating a dead zone. And this is just one of many, many dead zones happening all around the world. 
And so what this, I think, certification is trying to do is reconnect animals directly back into the land and for them to be able to play a regenerative role through being connected in the land, they can then eat the plants and then through well-distributed droppings, they can bring nitrogen back to the land. And I think the, the certification will be hard. It is a challenge. It is not impossible though. It is not. And um, we are setting the highest bar possible. As, a, as a, I'm a vegan too, I've been a vegan for many years, I would only want to get behind something super high. And I don't think something like this exists out there. We're, we're trying to create something aspirational that I think if the world got behind this certification, it, it could save the planet. I really think that. And with that, I'd like to invite Dana to tell us more about the social fairness pillar. Super excited to see so many people in the room. Uh, we, uh, Fair World Project, as Nova mentioned, we advocate for small-scale farmers, uh, fair trade for small-scale farmers, and labor justice for workers around the world. And you know, one thing I just want to mention, about three or four years ago, we actually did a workshop with Rodale Institute to talk about small-scale farmers and their role in regenerative agriculture. And the room was, there was like 20 people there. Like, people were not ready to talk about it. So it's so exciting to see so many people here. The reason why we were really excited to participate in creating this very high bar standard uh, was, well, for several reasons. One, so often uh, we're talking about regenerative agriculture, we're talking about organic agriculture, but we're not really talking about fairness to farmers and workers around the world. Farmers are losing their land. Um, workers are being more and more exploited. You know, we have you know our current administration cutting their budget to cut programs that are really important in the USDA and the EPA. Um, so there's things that we really need to think about when it comes to farmers and workers around the world. You know, we're an advocacy organization. We work on campaigning. Um, for policy, different policies. We don't believe that a market-based initiative can fix all the problems, you know, all the problems in the world for farmers and keep them on their land. We need to work on the farm bill. We need to support organizations that are working on the farm bill to put regenerative ag um, into the farm bill, um, to support small organic farmers in that farm bill and other policies. But we really do believe that this is the first step forward. Um, and it's a really positive way forward to really protect farmers and workers and make sure that farmers are being paid fair prices um, so that they can make a livelihood and stay on their land. There's lots of different fairness standards out there and it's pretty controversial. There's, you know, fair trade certification is winding up all over the place. At this point you can find fair trade um, certified produce that's coming out of the large chemical ag. We really wanted to keep a high bar standard, but we wanted to work with the existing certifications because they have all gone through their key stakeholder processes. So we wanted to work with them. We wanted to leverage those existing standards, but we really wanted to take all the high bar standards and make sure that even if an uh, um, operation is gonna be certified uh, by one of these certifications that maybe don't have all the key elements, that we can, we're still gonna keep that high bar in there. So we'll take those, we're in, in the middle of doing a gap analysis so that we can make sure that those key elements are still included and it will be an add-on. So you can use your existing certifications, um, but then include add-ons. Fair payments to farmers, that includes the true cost of production. Living wages, that's um, based on region. Um, collective bargaining rights for workers, which is extremely important. The Global South, making sure you're working and you're working with small-scale farmers, that they're organized in some way so that one farmer is not being heavily exploited. Uh, things like uh, long-term commitments, um, so things like that, and we are in the process of doing the gap analysis, and that will be uh, that will be available as soon as we're done with that. This is a really, really positive step forward. Um, our food system is unjust. We have not been able to. Um, figure out how to create something that really talks about the, you know, the problems with colonialism and racism and all these things that we're dealing with in our um, food system. And this is just the start, and I hope that we can continue this conversation around those issues that we're dealing with in the food system. Um, but this is a really positive step forward and a very high bar. Each of these pillars alone has really important positive impacts, but the potential of working with all three pillars at once creates a whole system that's self-reinforcing, and that's one of the unique benefits of the regenerative organic certification and standard. And with that, I want to move pretty quickly through the next part of our discussion, which is the how. How does this certification program work? How would any of your businesses, any of the farms that you source from or farms that you know of participate in this process? And let me preface that by saying that 
I'm Nova Sayers, and I work for an organization that's helping the Regenerative Organic Alliance to implement this program, and we're called NSF International. We're a public health and safety organization, and we consider the health of the environment to be a huge piece of our public health mission. And we achieve that mission by working on strong standards with high integrity and verification of claims in the marketplace, because these certifications and standards, these are market-based solutions. We're not waiting for the regulatory framework to catch up with this high bar aspiration and responsibility that we have in our industry. So let me walk you through this timeline real quickly here. A lot of work has already been done, but as you can see, there's, there's a lot more work to be done, and we need all of you to participate and help us achieve this timeline. Draft standard was placed on the NSF website for public comment, so we facilitated that process. But the standard was created by the alliance, so the people on this stage and everyone else who partnered with them, from brands to farmers to NGOs. Then it was submitted for your comment, and I hope that you did comment, and that comment can continue the public comment period has officially ended so that we can work now on incorporating all those comments. The Alliance has done that. Now NSF is working to build the certification system, which is a whole set of infrastructure here in the United States and around the world that works with certification bodies. And I want to point out to any of you that already work with an organic certification body or a certification body that um, provides the animal welfare and social fairness or fair trade standards, all of those certification bodies are invited to participate in this certification system. They need to apply with us, and they need to apply with you, the brands and farms that work with them. So we're accepting uh, applications for what we call pilots. And these pilots are basically road testing the standard and using that as a learning opportunity to figure out where the assessment needs to be adjusted. We want to make sure that it's that we're setting a high bar and that we're achieving the unique ROC requirements and practices that have been pointed out here, because those are the things that will drive the impact that this standard is designed to achieve. So let me just call those out once more. Those include soil testing, and there's a whole set of methodologies that have been very well uh, researched and vetted for that, but now we need to go out and apply them on farms and in different cropping systems around the world. Soil testing to measure soil health. Are we regenerating and restoring the soil? And in doing that, are we helping to draw down carbon to reverse climate change? How powerful could that be if farms all around the world and brands like yours who are sourcing from these farms could participate in achieving that impact? Some of the other unique requirements, I think Dana and Leah pointed these out, um, are pasture grazing and managed rotational grazing. Um, there are some standards that include components of these, but together the three pillars ensure that these unique impacts will be achieved. Um, the other one I want to point out is the use of the global living wage calculator and reporting on the wages that are paid to farmers and even family members on small family farms. Um, and then also the use of long-term contracts. The standard doesn't specify the terms of the contract, but it asks that buyers engage in a long-term partnership with farms so that farms can move through this process of continuous improvement. You can see that after the pilots, we're going to go back, do some adjustment. The Regenerative Organic Alliance will adjust the standard itself, and then we hope to fully launch in 2019. We'd like to have four to six pilots in diverse cropping systems around the world. And again, I invite any of you who are interested to send up a card, and we're going to work with you and your existing certification partner. So next, I want to talk about this journey. As you can see here, the path to regenerative organic certification includes many milestones, and it's a path of continuous improvement. And I think Rose mentioned many standards in the marketplace today kind of, they set a bar and there's no, there's no drive toward, towards a continuous improvement. There's no progressive implementation of even better practices over time, and that's built right into this standard, particularly in the areas of soil health. So we're going to be working on that aspect of the standard and mapping out the details of that journey. But I would say that any of you can join this journey wherever you are today. You may be a conventional operation, which I've got over there on the left. You may already have achieved non-GMO in your supply chain. But as you can see, there are many steps to regenerative organic. And there are three levels to regenerative organic certification. There's a bronze level, which is a off-pack level in which there wouldn't be a claim on product, and then there's a silver level, and then gold, which is really the high bar at which 100% of the acreage in a, any given operation is certified. I want to show you the roadmap. So there's essentially two pathways to regenerative organic that I want to delve into. 
First, for those of you who, are already, uh, who already work with certified organic operations or have certified organic products, you may already be looking at adopting some animal welfare standards or some fair trade or fair labor standards. And if so, you're going to have a faster path to regenerative organic. In that situation, if you've already got these other um, certifications in the three pillar areas, you'll need to focus on those unique requirements of the ROC. Again, those unique requirements are what really drive the positive impact and potential of this high bar standard. If you're not already certified organic or you're not working with certified organic operations, you'll need to start a little sooner and the timeline will be longer for you. So you'll need to go through that three year transition period to organic and start looking at your system and how to incorporate animal welfare practices and fair trade practices. And we can work with you to identify those certification bodies that will help you along that transition period. I have to say it's gonna be different for different organizations different cropping systems, but we're looking at possibly a six year path all the way from conventional to regenerative organic. Let's talk about labeling. I know that's on a lot of people's minds. So as far as labeling goes, the bronze level of regenerative organic does not allow on pack labeling, but it does reward organizations that are on this journey, allowing them to make all kinds of claims and do storytelling around the investment that they've made in, the, in this process. And that could happen off pack on your website, in your marketing collateral, et cetera. So we definitely encourage communication about it. Once you've achieved the silver level, we'd like to allow you to use that on pack claim. And the requirements for the use of the claim on pack are fully aligned with the organic requirements. So there's a made with regenerative organic, and there's a full certification level at which you can use that certification mark that you see on the lower left of the package there. And we do fully expect that most products will carry both the regenerative organic seal and all of the other seals under the three pillars, so organic, animal welfare, and fair trade or uh, social fairness. A lot of people think that the whole concept of regenerative organic stems from infighting that's been going on in divisive discussions between fractions of the organic community, and that couldn't be further from the truth. It's why I opened my comments by talking about the decades of work that have really gone in to the construction and the creation of, of the ROC standard. This is not a knee-jerk reaction to any one component of the conversation that's happening with the NOP, the NOSB, or any other faction within the organic community. We support organic 100%. But we also believe that soil is critical to the health of people. It's not, regenerative isn't only about regenerating the soil. It's about regenerating farms. It's about regenerating farmers. It's about regenerating the human spirit. It's about regenerating communities. And we can't do that if we don't focus our attention on the soil. So within our system of what we're putting out as a standard, you must have soil in the system. If it's one of the three pillars and it's not there, the stool falls over. So soil is a critical component to uh, our concept of a re truly regenerative system and the soil has to be part of it. Well, I think a lot of the principles that are in the standard are supporting, you know, small-scale farmers. In terms of like an official kind of mm -hmm. affiliation with them, I, I would really, say we, we haven't been, but there are so many ways in which, I mean, that intersects with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what I would say directly. Yeah, and on an organizational level, we do work a little bit with the slow food movement, but not in this capacity. So, yeah. yeah. And there is an alliance, um, but there's also um, an ask that, that the Regenerative Organic Alliance has been um, communicating here at Expo, which is for organizations to commit and to partner. And so there's more information about that on the Regen Organic website. Uh, so if there are other organizations that you think can get behind this commitment and this journey, please let them know. We fully uh, price in the costs, you know, any additional certification costs or actually bear them directly with the farmers that we deal with. Yeah, I mean, we're, I guess, very public and transparent. We have, we have no problem sharing that. And I just I also wanted, uh, Nova, you did say it could be a six-year process, and I just want to say, like, no matter how bad someone may be farming in a conventional way, you know, if the, that three years, I mean, in, in that three-year organic transition process, if they put in place the correct animal welfare and social criteria and soil health, they could be gold. Uh, you know, regenerative right. gold at, at, at near three. three years. Yeah. And then the other thing is that um, that the, the multiple certifications, there are certain certifications 
certification bodies that do both social and soil health, and then even animal welfare. Um, and in fact, Natureland, we had a, a meeting yesterday, and it's kind of exciting to see, like, oh, they're wanting to come into the states and offer, offer their program. And I was like, wow, well, you could be a certification body under the ROC and really offer that kind of one-stop shop uh, certification so that you're not dealing with you know, the multiple certifications. Although I think it's important to know, like animal welfare proof, for example, is free. It's a, it's a free certification. Just to tag on to that, uh, we've been in contact with many farmers across the country. And one farmer, I think, put it best when he said, Sometimes I feel like a Boy Scout with a sash full of merit badges. I got every certification I could possibly get. And it really, I could just visualize what his operation was like. And he said, couldn't I just have one seal that says I do, I do it all? Everything, all the values that people want in my product, it's in there under this seal. So in some cases, it will be a simplified process for those farmers that are already at that gold level. And for some farmers who are conventional, it's a struggle, but we've talked to some conventional farmers already that have said, we're interested in the highest bar standard we can possibly obtain. If we're gonna to transition to organic, we're gonna go all the way to regenerative organic. We're not gonna stop at just organic. And so there's opportunity for everybody to come into this, uh, into this certification uh, program at whatever level they're at. And I want to iterate uh, that this is also for the Regenerative Organic Alliance, this is a journey, and when new standards are brought to the marketplace, they are tested and they continue to be refined over time, and that certainly has happened with organic and with many of the other equivalent standards here. So I wouldn't want you to walk away thinking that we're going to have a few pilots and then this will be set in stone, it won't. And I think the Alliance fully expects that there will be another um, comment period and other stakeholders will be asked to engage but we do want to test the system and we need to get the boat in the water and test it. And so we need organizations who are willing to step up and be part of that pilot. There's nothing punitive about it. It's just working through the assessment process. And we do want to test it in different cropping systems, different geographic regions, and at different times of the year. So the pilots won't all be held in the same month or anything like that. That'll work out over the, the course of the rest of this year. People who are in this room will hold us accountable, but there is an advisory committee that, that is uh, an elected board of directors, and Rodeo Institute is clearly on that board, and we've been in, in favor of all the components of this standard for a long time. So, so the, answer, the answer is no. Nobody will audit raw in terms of... There is no USDA accredited auditor, except for the organic piece. How will you be held accountable transparently you are granting that seal according to your standards. Nobody's getting any favors. Okay. Any standard should be held to certain accountability. Um, there should be certain accountability mechanisms in place. And NSF International's role is to work with standards in that fashion. So let me just make this clear. There will be many certification bodies. And let's keep an open mind. There have been many new standards that have brought to mar been brought to market that have been refined and that have been very successful in achieving impact. Um, there are certification bodies who are already accredited by other independent institutions who hold them accountable for the organic standard, that's the pillar, the first pillar and the foundation, for the animal welfare standards and for the fair trade standards. Many of those are also what we call accredited, meaning there is a, a watchdog, if you will, or there's a system of checks and balances. In addition, NSF will be working with the certification bodies. So, NSF's role is to provide some of that accountability, and we do that with over 160 standards around the world, and we are audited ourselves, and we are held accountable in that role. So there's actually a multi-layered system. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but let's give it a chance. Right. Nova, can I, can I yeah. add to that? Just on the animal welfare pillar, because the first requirement is to use one of these three certifications, those three certifications have independent auditors that audit those certifications before they go then to, to, the, to the ROC. So, and those are, you know, through IMF or there, there are some IMI, IMI or Earth Claims are doing that, those third party auditing. So there's auditing within auditing, I think, happening within this standard. So we've talked about labeling. We know that labeling is the keystone to unlocking the power of this positive feedback loop between farms, brands, 
and you and I as shoppers and purchasers uh, to achieve the impact that these standards want to achieve. So that's reversing climate change, improving soil health, and improving the welfare of animals and people in our food and farming system. So that consumer education piece is, is a large one, and it's done by everyone who's part of that positive feedback mm -hmm. loop. But I think the ROA mm -hmm. is looking at some specific investments in that area. Yep. We are. Yeah, and I think you know we have um, a great list of allies. Mariano's here from Denone Wave. Um, we signed up. Um, you know, there's there's like incredible brands that are in this room and that, that have agreed to go on the journey. And I really believe that we will figure out how to communicate to the customer because that's what we're good at doing is, mm -hmm. is figuring out how to do that. So I have a lot of confidence that we can figure that out. And with that, we're really at the end of our time here, but we invite any of you, wherever you are on your journey in this regenerative movement, that's the right place to start. And let's get moving. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys.